Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. If this is your first time here, my name's Caleb, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd just like to welcome you. Uh, you came on a really great day because we're starting uh, a new series, and uh, we're going to look at the books of Ezra and Nehemiah over the next several weeks. Um, and I say it's a great Sunday to show up because we're starting a new series because um, sometimes you can show up in the middle of the series and you're like, what is this guy talking about? And um, now you get to track with us. So um, welcome. Yay. Yeah. You're like, I'm not lost. Who, nobody gets to be like, no one likes to be lost, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah, you won't be lost. Um, Couple context things about this series. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, Christina gave a message about uh, uh, Moses uh, receiving his call to go be a, a liberator of Israel at the burning bush. And uh, she didn't know it at the time, but uh, it was actually a really great pretext for what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks because um, Ezra and Nehemiah has a lot of really uh, interesting features to it. But one of the things that kind of stands out to me. Uh, and, and this is this is something that I get because I'm a Bible nerd. Um, the the New Testament. When we look at the New Testament, you know, we know that the the Old Testament is the like the foundation for the the New Testament. It's all over the place. Uh, the writers are just always quoting uh, the Psalms and the prophets and the Torah and you know uh, the, just all of the old text Old Testament texts, um, except one book. They leave out. You know what that book is? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Ne- Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Jesus loved to quote Psalms. He loved to quote the Old Testament. He loved to quote uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and you know the prophets and the Psalms, um, as well as the other writers in the New Testament. They loved to quote all of them. But curiously, one of the books that they they actually leave out, and I and I I say book as a singular thing because Ezra and Nehemiah is, you know, was written as one single book. Um, and uh, now in the modern day, we, uh, we actually divide them into two books, but um, it's one book. Um, and uh, the center of that book is actually in like the chapter two range, um, which is interesting. We'll get there. Um, but uh, Jesus, you know, for uh, as pivotal of a moment, you know, so if you look at the, you look at the narrative of uh, the history of Israel, uh, there's this, this crucial moment that's happening in the midst of Ezra and Nehemiah, and it actually paves the way for uh, what's known as Second Temple uh, Judaism, which uh, is uh, the Judaism that Jesus actually practiced. So this, this new form of Judaism actually was uh, uh, a reform of the original sort of Mosaic law. It was actually where they decided, um, you know, this this covenant that God gave us at Sinai, I think we should ought to take a really long look at that and begin living differently. Um, and so they began to live uh, exactly as, as God had had laid out to them in the, the covenant. And uh, so this marks, a, Ezra and Nehemiah marks a, a very pivotal point for, for Israel. Um, and it's just so interesting to me as kind of a Bible nerd that uh, Jesus doesn't say anything about this. Nothing, nothing. And, and so, you know, you, you, Timothy talks about uh, how uh, all scripture, you know, is God breathed and, and inspired and useful. Um, for uh, uh, instruction and, you know, just like th- there's all these, these things and correction, all these. And, and Paul uh, even charges Timothy, hey, remember the scriptures that you learned from, from a, as a child, which uh, actually make you wise for salvation. And, uh, you know, Paul quotes also, loves to quote the prophets, loves to quote the Psalms, loves to quote the, uh, the, the Pentateuch. He, he loves to quote all these books of the Bible. But again, Paul just like Jesus, is silent on Ezra and Nehemiah. But does that mean Ezra and Nehemiah has no value? No. I think it has um, great value for us as, as Christians because its overall theme is, is building, is construction. Uh, and I think, it pay, I think it really paints a good picture of what it looks like for us to commit our life to God's purposes. And 
when I say God's purposes, I don't necessarily just mean like um, the general purposes, right? Because, um, or, or the general call. I actually mean, like Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, that God has good works for us. And, and when, when he, is, he is saying good works, he's not just sort of like saying, oh yeah, you know, these are, the, these are the, the things we ought to be doing as Christians. He's saying no, that God has a specific plan and a purpose for your life. Those are the good works. And so when you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a few people that sort of turn up as, as uh, recurring characters throughout the, the, the narrative. And one of the things that you notice is that each of these people, um, they have a very specific task. They have a spe- very specific thing to do. And the, the, the story, the books of the Bible Ezra, of Nezer and Nehemiah that actually contains kind of a, a good picture of what it looks like to take something very specific that God has given me or you or us and to begin to live with a type of focus, with a type of uh, intentionality that sees that thing through to completion. It'll tell us all of the things that we're going to face. And we are. We're going to face, you know, there's a process. You'll see uh, throughout the, the story that there's, uh, there's opposition that comes with doing what God called you to do. Um, so one of the, one of the things back to a couple weeks ago, Christina, um, talked about, you know, talked this, this idea of calling, uh, one of the things that messages like that do is it, like it plants a seed, you know, anybody ever since like you were here a few weeks ago and you like, you heard that message and you're like, yeah, what am I, what am I called to do? Anybody want to like say, yeah, you know, like you start wondering. And, and in that, that, uh, that wondering, we, start, we just start like maybe daydreaming. Like what does that really look like for God to use my life for his purposes? Or what does it look like to, you know, um, be called by God? You know, that's such a, um, that's such a, like, can I just say, as a, even as a pastor, that's a very confusing term. It is. Like I, and I, I, you're like, wait a minute. Like you're supposed to, you're supposed to have worked all this stuff out. Um, you're the guy that we come to for advice on this thing. And, um, and I, I, I think it's confusing for a number of reasons because throughout the Bible, when you see calling or you, you sort of I, identify with this sense of calling, uh, even in the, the, uh, cultural Christian context, when we talk about calling, um, we are, we're talking about something very broad and very specific at the same time. Is that right? I mean, can you identify, like, yeah, I'm, when I'm, like you're thinking you're calling, like you're, um, and the Bible uses it from a sort of a, a macro and a micro type of perspective. Um, and the macro, it's, uh, and the New Testament talks about this, it this way, that we are, we are called to Christ. We are called to, to lay down our life for Christ. We are called to follow in the way of Christ. And so that's, that's a very sort of broad stroke, isn't it? Yeah, that's, it's, but in general, like we're called to Christ. That's, that is our, our calling. Um, I think it's a little bit narrow when you start looking at uh, the, the writings of the Apostle Paul um, because he talks about, he talks about being, uh, um, being called to Christ and uh, but also he talks about how he was called as an apostle to the Gentiles so in one sense you have a very broad stroke and then you know you see it in kind of a context where it's a little bit more focused right and in our lives it it does it goes from broad to to a little more focused Um, the the issue is, is that we look, and, and Christina was right when she said that our calling gives us this sense of identity. For Paul, it very much did. For Moses, it did. For Isaiah, it did. For Ezekiel, it did. Uh, for Abraham, it did. For Noah, it did. And, and so on, and so on, and so on. When people like Paul was, you know, kicked off the donkey, um, Jesus said, you're, you're, you're now called to be my vessel as an apostle to the Gentiles. And that's like, oh, okay, well, you know, that's a, that's a very broad title, right? 
Now, the trouble with that, and this is, this is where I think it really becomes confusing, is because we, within the midst of that, when you may have an idea of what you're really called to as a person, uh, or you have no idea at all, um, and you're wondering, you're questioning, Lord, what is it that you're really calling me to? Um, what, what we want to know are the specifics. Like if you just use the Apostle Paul as an example, um, you know, he, as an apostle to the Gentile, I mean, that's a, like, that's, that's a very broad stroke, isn't it? Because, you know, from a, you know, first century um, Jew like Paul, who was raised up under Gamaliel, who was from the tribe of Benjamin, who was, you know, had all of these, these, you know, noble Jewish credentials, um, it, it would have, like, like, wait a minute, like, the Gentile world is huge compared to where he was from. Now, he was, he was from Tarsus, which is, you know, outside of, you know, the, the Jewish, you know, Israel world, um, and so he understood that, but he also, like this, like being an apostle of the Gentiles, he must have had to ask himself the question, where do I start, <laughs> right? What, what, is, what is next for me? And, and what you see throughout the book of Acts is, is Paul sort of beginning this process of what, is it, um, what does it look like? You know, so the first thing he does is he actually goes and begins to preach uh, to the Gentiles. And you know, he's like, okay, all right, I'm going to start doing this. But he also goes to the synagogues and gets beat and um, gets run out of town. And then what's interesting, he disappears for 13 years. Most... Most people sort of miss that. When you think about Paul, and most people miss that detail. It says in Galatians that he actually went away for 13 years. Yeah, that's like, that makes your head spin. Like, wow, what was he doing during that time? Repenting. <laughs> repenting. <laughs> Good. Yeah, he had a lot of repenting to do. Um, so, when we think about calling, we're thinking about like the broad, we're, 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 we're thinking about the macro and the micro at the same time. And, and most of us, I mean, if we're just really honest, um, most of us are really just trying to figure out what's next, right? Like that's like, okay, God, how, how does my next step align with what you have for my life, right? We just want to know and we're just asking the question god what do you have for me right now um anybody old enough to remember the uh the old psa uh things that they used to do in the gi joe cartoon yeah some of you oh yeah remember what they used to say they give this psa about you know not talking to strangers and then you know at the end of it they would tag on this uh um this phrase and you know what it is knowing is half the battle, right? Um, and the older that I get, uh, I'm actually convinced that's not true. <laughs> like it was a good thing. Like, oh, knowing is half the battle. The other half, I mean, what is, I mean, you have to ask yourself the question. If knowing is half the battle, knowing what it is that I'm supposed to do is half the battle, what, what is the other half of the battle? What's actually doing it, right? Um, the, the, issue, the issue with that is it's not necessarily like just knowing um, I, I think it's, if I were to rewrite that today, I would go, yeah, you know, I think knowing is a third of the battle. Walking it out is the two-thirds. The, the other half is actually doing it. Um, knowing, is, knowing is the easy part. Um, and Ezra, when it comes to knowing, like if, if like you really want to know what is it that we're supposed to do, um, the, that comes a, kind of a, Throughout Nezer and Nehemiah, it actually comes to people in, in one of three ways. Uh, and it's very unique. And I, I would say uh, this, is, this just is kind of like the nature of God. Like he is not going to do the same thing over and over and over again uh, for everybody. He's, he's going to do it differently. And throughout Ezra and Nehemiah, you, you see um, first this guy shows up uh, his name is uh, Zerubbabel or um, Belshazzar. And uh, 
what you need to know about Ezra and Nehemiah, if you're going to read it along with us, um, that uh, it, it spans two cultures. The, the book, it spans, like it, there's, in, in one sense, there is a, a sort of a, a Jewish Hebrew um, culture that is happening, that is sort of, you know, moving through the whole book, and is actually moving away from a, a Persian culture uh, back towards this, this Hebrew culture. Um, and so you'll, you'll find that one person has two names. And you actually use, in the exilic texts, you see this very frequently. You're like, wait a minute, I thought that person was, or who's this guy? <laughs> like, it's like it's, uh, and Daniel, uh, da- you, you get Daniel and then you uh, get uh, um, It was right on the tip of my tongue. Um, anyway, you get his, his uh, Babylonian name. And so you see throughout the Bible, like in this, this era, the, uh, it seems like there's two different people. They're actually the same person. And they're just, what's happening is they're, they're moving. The narrative is actually moving from a, um, uh, an outside culture into an inside culture culture. It's moving away from uh, exile back into the, the homeland. And so what's happening in the midst of the story is that the characters are giving up their, their uh, exile uh, identity and they're embracing uh, their homeland identity, which is uh, not usually the way that things happen uh, in the world. It goes the other direction where uh, when you have a sort of a, a people who are uh, migrating from one culture to another culture, um, when they go back to their homeland, they don't re-embrace the culture of uh, their homeland. Actually, what they do is they take the, on the culture of the land that they were living in and they take it back. And so, But in the Bible, it actually is reversed. They were outside of the bubble and they went back into the bubble and they said, wait a minute, we need to reestablish our culture. Uh, anyway, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So... I got way ahead of myself. <laughs> Shesh Bazaar, Zerubbabel, same person. And he's charged with leading the, the rebuilding of the temple. And so throughout the book, there's three very unique things ha- happen. Um, it's, it's chronological. The first is uh, uh, Zerubbabel or Shesh Bazaar is sent to, to rebuild the temple. And by the way, what's, what's unique about him is that it actually calls him, uh, I think in Ezra chapter 2, he was, uh, it names him Zerubbabel, the prince of Judah. Um, and he, the things you need to know about him is he is actually in the line of King David. He was a descendant of David. And so when it says he was a prince of Judah, he was actually, there's a, that's a reference that, that, whoa, this guy, he's not, he's not just like some randomly selected guy. He was actually the, the heir to the throne. And so, I mean, you can imagine if he was like the heir to the throne was sent to rebuild the temple, you could imagine what people would have thought, right? Like, wait a minute, this is, this is, this is the beginning of the reestablishment of David's throne. It doesn't actually end up happening. Um, and uh, anyway, so I'll go on. So Shesh Bazaar and Zerubbabel are the same guy, uh, different names. Uh, the culture is moving from one place to another place. Uh, it's being reestablished. Uh, he rebuilds, he leads the rebuilding of the temple. And the first thing that he does is rebuild the altar and establish worship again in the temple mount um, here's how it comes to him right so before before we can really begin our our life's work um, before we can really begin to know what it is exactly that God has for each and every one of us before we can begin to to know um, the narrowest perspective on our calling we have to know what it is, right? Yeah, we have to know what it is. And, and by the way, so uh, when we think about calling, let's just say one more thing. I, I think it would be helpful. And I'm uh, actually, Nehemiah chapter two, 
says it this way. I think this is a good way to look at it. It says, and this was the verse that was in the, the bumper video. It says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem, he's talking about the, the destruction of the, the, the temple or the, of Jerusalem, the wall. And uh, the king had said, hey, uh, well, we'll get to that context. Anyway, so he's talking to a group of guys. Nehemiah is. You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and his gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. And I also told them about the gracious hand of God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. And so then they began the good work. One of the things I want to focus in on over the next several weeks as we talk about this. Um, I want to get away from this, the language of calling. And I want to get to the language of good work. Because that is, that is, the, that is the language that he uses here. Like this, when they talk about what it is that they're doing, they're using this, this term, good work. And so um, when we talk about the things that the Lord is really have like has for each and every one of us, the things that we're doing inside and for the kingdom of God, it's a good work. It's what Paul calls the good work, okay? And I, I think that's, that's helpful because um, when you parse out the way that, that calling is, is used, what happens is um, you, you get to this idea that uh, there's a difference between my identity and my assignment. Do you know the difference? Yes? You know, I mean, you know that there's a, there's, there is a difference between your, I mean, many of you were military, our military, former military, retired military, God bless you. Um, you understand assignments. You understand rank and your, your identity as a, as, a, as a ranking officer, but also you understand that as, as, as you progress and as you go through your career, your assignment changes. And that, that is true for all of us. That is, that, and it's, it's, it's dangerous for us to actually look at our calling as a sense of identity. Do you know that? Because what happens when the assignment changes? Do I have to change who I am? No. No. The assignment, the, Paul went from assignment to assignment. He was the apostle of the Gentiles and he goes from assignment to assignment to assignment. This may, this may really surprise you um, as, a, as a pastor. I, I actually, people ask me like, hey, when did you get your call to ministry? I, I didn't. Like, I, I, you're like, wait a minute, whoa. Like, big moment. Like, is that possible? Yeah. One, one of the things that, that and this is, this is why I, I I'm, I'm so kind of deeply rooted in this message is because um, my identity, my calling is as a servant to Christ, as a, as a leader in the body of Christ. And throughout my, throughout my life over the last almost 20 years, I was telling people for a long time, like, oh, say, how long you been on staff? Like, oh, I've been 15 years. And I thought about it actually. Um, I, I think next year will be 19 for me. And I'm like, I was just telling people 15 years. I'm like, oh, I've been on staff for 15 years. I'm not, no, I haven't been. I'm pushing 20. Um, anyway, um, throughout, my, throughout my life, over the last 20 years, I have just gone from assignment to assignment to assignment. That's all. And, and you know what will happen sometime in the next 20 years? I'll get a new assignment. I will. And that may shock you. You're like, wait a minute, what will we do then? Well, you'll figure it out. Uh, you guys are resourceful. Uh, sometimes we get, we get into an assignment and the assignment becomes who we are as a person. And then what happens is God calls us to do something else and it feels like an, we're having an identity crisis. I've seen this. I've seen this over and over and over again. It happens. So um, I want to 
focus in on the good work, okay? I want to call it the good work. And when I mean good work, I mean assignment. So Sheshbazar, Zerubbabel, gets his assignment. Ezra chapter 1, verse 3, it says, In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, it says, In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Stop there. So what's about to happen in, in the, the text, or what's happening in the text, is he's, he's referring back to something that's been spoken uh, by uh, the Jeremiah the prophet, and it provides context for everything that's happening. And uh, what he's referring to, what the author is referring to, is uh, Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29. Uh, if you'd like to turn there, you can, but I'm going to mash it up and I'm going to read it real quick. Uh, this is what the prophet said. And he's talking about um, Israel's idolatry. Their worshiping of false gods um, is going to cause a problem. And this is what the prophet says. This whole country, this is verse 11 of chapter 25. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So this is what, and this is jumping to Jeremiah 29, um, the four chapters in between really deal with Israel's problem. This was what caused like he was talking this this event hadn't happened yet he said this thing's going to happen where you guys are Israel's you're good your your nation is going to be destroyed your people are going to be carried off you're going to be subjugated by another nation you're no longer going to have say so over your lives you're going to be in captivity and the whole the whole reason for that is because you guys have done a, a series of bad things the Lord told you, this is what it looks like to walk in, in covenant with me, and you didn't do that. And so he spends four chapters kind of uh, expounding on that. And then in 29, 11, you've probably heard this passage before. He says this. This is just like the, the moment of reconciliation. And this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back into this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to not to harm you, but plans to give you hope in a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And you will listen to me and you will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And will bring you back from captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And will bring you back to the place from which I have carried you into exile. Basically, Jeremiah's prophecy is basically, this, you guys, your, your sin is going to produce a pile of rubble. But the Lord, your God, is faithful to you. And he is going to take you from a pile of rubble to a, to a great revival. Amen. That's a good word, right? That's Ezra 1, back to Ezra 1. That's what he's referring to. This is the fulfillment of his prophecy. To, to bring them back from captivity and to start a revival. The time is right after 70 years. And so he goes on, right? So in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah to go from rubble to revival, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation. This, okay, so how, how, do we, how do we learn? This is, the, this is the first way. How do we learn what God wants us to do? This is the first way. Next week, we'll talk about uh, two other ways. The first, the first is through the word of the Lord. It's his, it's his voice. It was his voice for here in this, this context. It was his voice to Jer through Jeremiah the prophet. And also, it was his voice through the proclamation of Cyrus. It's his voice. He will, he will tell you directly, and also, guess what? He will use other people to tell you. 
How do we know? That's how we know. It's through his voice. It's through the voice of other people in our lives. What's interesting, actually, side note to this, um, I said early on that uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah has uh, some interesting features in it. And one of the most interesting points, you know, so there's this transition that's happening actually in the known world at the time. Um, and they're, they're moving from an oral proclamation to a written proclamation. And so through, throughout the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, one of the recurring themes is actually the writing of letters. This, this occurs nowhere prior to this point in history. Like all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was, there was authority in the written word. Just let that sink in. Like that's, within, a, within 150 years, the, the, first, the first Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament would begin to be produced. And you're like, where'd that start? Well, that starts in Ezra. Because the king decides, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a letter. I'm going to write a letter. And in this letter, this is what it says. This is what the Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. And any among his people... You may all go up to Jerusalem and Judah, and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And may their God be with them. This is the king. This is, this is a king who thought he was a God. Saying this. Now you have to ask yourself the question, was there any type of like reason that he did this? I mean, it says that God. What's, what's neat about this is that uh, when you, you look at this, this proclamation of Cyrus um, and you study Cyrus as a person, this was, this was common for him. This was actually, you could call it his foreign policy. Uh, his foreign policy was to protect, his, to protect his kingdom, to protect his castle. One of the things that he did was to... Um, take the nations that he conquered and say, hey, rather than keep you here in my land, I'm going to send you home and I'm going to give you some money to rebuild a temple for your God. And, and when my enemies come marching towards my kingdom and my castle, will you protect me? Because we're friends, right? It was, a, it was his strategy. It was his political foreign policy strategy. This is what he did. But, but the, here's the interesting thing about about the, the proclamation here is that this is a one of a kind. Historians have found several different proclamations of Cyrus throughout the whole uh, known world at the time. They, he, this was just like it was a, a form letter that he had. Here, go back to your nation and build a temple. But this one, this one, this is, this is why it's so unique. He crafts specifically to the context of Israel. It's like the, the Lord really did like kind of stir his heart, write this specifically. And we know it today as our scripture. So, how do we become aware? Well, the first thing is his voice. The second, the second way is that God will use people to tell you what it is that God thinks and has a, a purpose for your life. When I was in my early 20s, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, late teens, early 20s, um, people all my life would ask me this question, hey, are you going to be a pastor like your dad? And, and I hated that question. I really did. I, 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 just, I just go, oh, no, please. I hope not. Um, actually, my, my standard response was, no, I think I'm going to go into business. Um, because, you know, business people drive Porsches and Ferraris. And um, I'd like to drive a Porsche and a Ferrari. Pastors don't do that. So uh, 
that was my standard response. And uh, like, no, that, that whole, you know, laying down your life thing, not cool with that. Um, and so, but uh, the, the older that I got, the more into my 20s, I mean, it was like, um, I, I was a, a teenager that, uh, you know, was a terrible student in school. Like I, in high school, like I just was awful. I, I, I barely, barely have a high school diploma. Um, and I, I hated school. And so when I got out of school, I, I actually worked as a, as a landscaper. And uh, I worked on a landscaping crew. And sometimes I led the crew. And sometimes I'm just like, okay, let's, you know, this is what I did. Um, that was my day, my day job. And uh, I, I had this, this sense of anxiety within me. Like, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Like, I mean, it's like, if you're not... 19 years old and asking that question, are you really 19? Um, but I, I was like, okay, like, what am I supposed to do with my life? And I, I went through this period of, of my life where I just really struggled. Like, I just didn't, didn't know. Um, and I explored several different options and different avenues and like, okay, well, what is it? Um, and uh, at, uh, at one point, I... I felt like, okay, well, I need to do something. I can't, I'm not going to do this forever. Um, and I, I kind of sensed, well, you know, I might miss what God wants me to do, right? I knew God. I, I believed in God. I loved him. And, and, you know, even though at 19 years old or 20, I wasn't really living for the Lord um, I, I knew that he still had something for me, but I, I really didn't know what that was. And so I kind of had this anxiety, like we talk about anxiety around calling. I had this anxiety that like somehow I was gonna just like oversleep, you know, as 19 year olds do. Like at me at 19, you gotta understand, like uh, I, I probably went to like one or two church services that I was on time for a year, like I mean, a, in, a, in a given year, there was probably one or two church services uh, that I, I actually showed up to on time. Most others, uh, if I didn't oversleep, I, I showed up towards the end of service just in time to catch the prayer. Um, and that was me. So I kind of had this thought, well, okay, well, maybe, you know, it was like whatever I'm supposed to do with my life was spoken about at church, but I overslept and I missed it. Anybody have that? No? You're like, no, I'm, I woke up today so that you'd tell me. Um, I also had this, this thought that, well, maybe, maybe our, our, uh, our purpose is one of these things that if we're just like, we, we have to be in like perfect alignment. And if we're not within like perfect alignment, then, you know, like whatever it is we're trying to intersect, we, we just, we miss Right, and so I had this anxiety, like I, if I, I just didn't like it, and it sort of generated a legalism in me, where I'm like, okay, I just got to be like the right place at the right time, like I got to get my act together, and then boom, it like it will it will happen, it'll just be like spontaneous combustion. And so I had this this anxiety in me that 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 like I could just like miss it, or um, that I would I would be told the third sort of form of anxiety that I had is that it would be told what it was going to be, but um, it would produce, um, well, the, let's just say this, that the, the cost would be too high. And I couldn't bear the cost. And so that anxiety led me into a whole different, you know, series of different types of, you know, behaviors and not all of them were healthy. None of them, actually, none of them were healthy. None of them, looking back, I go, that was, that was actually the only the wrong way to look at the whole thing. Because what I was really looking for was God to tell me the whole thing, right? He was, he was, I was looking for him to say, well, first this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this. But really, What I was missing was that the Lord was just really going to tell me the first step. And that, that may be like where you're at today. Like you're wanting to see like, well, let me just see the whole thing through the scope of eternity. 
Let me, let me just see like all of my life through the end of my life, you know, and this looking back, you know, and this kind of like a, a, a Christmas carol type of thing where, you know, you're taken into a different, you know, phase of your life and you just get to see who you are, who you become. No, we're, we're given the first step. The first, and that was, that was, that for me, that's, that's really where, it, like, it began. I, I remember being 20 years old, um, and finally what I de- had decided to do, um, at, at 20, I mean, this is, this is just so, like, where I was. I, at 20 years old, I was uh, landscaping by day, and by night, I was actually a, a bar bouncer, Really, I, like I would not just, like, you're like, wait a minute, that's so out of character for you. But that's what I did. Like that was, you know, like, okay, well, I had friends that were on that scene. I had, you know, a job over here doing this. And so I just was kind of wandering through life, hoping at some point I'd figure it out. Um, and one of my, one of my friends uh, at the time actually convinced me to um, go with him through the police academy. He goes, oh, you got to join the police academy with me. And I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of a struggling 20-year-old and have no idea what to do. That sounds like a good thing to do. What did I know? I'm sure it was a great thing to do. It was an honorable job. But I, I remember, so I, I, I did all the research and I got all the um, material together and I started writing my application. And um, I, I had this this thought, like right before, like it was all done, it was all complete, and all I had to do was sign it and put it in an envelope and, and mail it. And I, I had this thought, like, hey, just, just ask me. Just ask me. I'm like, what? Where'd that come? It was, a, it was just a spontaneous thought. I, I mean, I, I grew up with this idea that God speaks to us. And it was just this thought, like, oh, just ask me. And so... I, I don't know where that came from. So I put my pen down and I said, okay, Lord, is this, is this the right thing for me? I don't need to know all of it. I surrender actually knowing all of it. But I just, I said, Lord, is this the right thing for me? And all he said was no. He just said, no, this is not what I want for you. I have a better plan. And, and I, I just, I remembered at that point, 19, almost, almost 20, going on 21, I, uh, I, put my pen, I put my pen down and I began to sob. Because it was actually the first time in my life where actually I, I started to believe that God had a purpose for me. I didn't know what it was, but I, I felt his sense of purpose. And the the little phrase, no. No. Now, for a lot of people, that decision might be a yes. But for me, it was a no. And it's, God, I I trust you. I trust your no. It was the first time that I just really connected this, 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 this idea that God has a purpose. He has a good work for my life. But, it, but that wasn't it for me. That wasn't it. And so I, I began to, to sense that. It wasn't long after that that I, um, I actually started attending church. I was like, 20, was like 21, started getting to church on time, believe it or not. Um, at the time, we had a Saturday night service. And so that was really easy, like really easy. Um, and uh, one of the things that would happen was, uh, this, is, this is just a lot of sort of detail, but um, one of the things that happened was I would... Uh, I would go to church on Saturday night. I had gotten a better job, an actually more respectable job. Um, I would come to church on Saturday night, and as I was leaving, like as my sort of like way to just kind of invest in the next generation, I started, uh, I would stop into the youth ministry, and I would just have conversations with some of the pastor's kids and um, 
some of the other youth, and I would encourage them, and then I would leave. And um, that behavior actually opened a door. Um, and a friend of mine uh, who was on staff at the time, who was in San Diego right now, he, uh, he, he was a prophetic voice in my life at the time. And uh, he told me, he said, hey, I just really had this word that like the Lord is going to open a door for you to, to enter ministry, and you're going to have an assignment, and it's going to be okay. Uh, trust him, just, just walk through it. And um, so I, I thought, oh, okay, all right, Lord, if that, that is your will, that's your will, I'm, I surrender. And, uh, but I, I would just like, I'd stop in and go, hey, God, guys, how are you doing? But that little act eventually led to, um, they needed somebody to teach junior high school students. Uh, <laughs> it was like, and that's, and, and somebody one day said, hey, I'm going to take you to lunch. And I said, okay, he wants me to, you know, lead a, a, a small group of uh, junior high school students. And, uh, and I ended up saying, no, actually, we don't want you to do that. We actually want you to lead the whole ministry. And I thought, oh, I don't know how to do that. And that's, but I just said, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you my yes. And so I said yes. And that was the, that was my first like official ministry assignment was leading middle school students. So, um, yeah, that, I didn't have the whole thing. But what I had was I had a, I had a belief that the Lord is really like speaking to me and, and he did speak to me, and I understood that he spoke through other people, and he did speak through other people, and guiding and directing my life towards the good work. And so if you're, you're here today, I mean, this is, this is, how, this is how God begins to, to steer the rudder of the ship of our lives, is he, he speaks to us, he uses his voice to our hearts. And in order to hear his voice, you're probably like, oh yeah, right, God speaks. Huh, ha, 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 yeah. He does. Is it audible? Well, some people have heard the audible voice of God. I've never heard the audible voice of God. At least not yet. But I know people who have heard the audible voice of God. For me, oddly enough, and I think for all of us, the voice of the Lord sounds a lot like our own voice. You ever have a thought that just sort of just spontaneously enters your mind and you think, where'd that come from? It's likely, I mean, I I know people who have spontaneous thoughts all the time and they go, oh, God doesn't speak to me. And it's, it's it's more likely that God is speaking to you in a language that you know and a voice that you know. Some people have dreams. Some people have visions. Me, when I, when I hear the, the voice of the Lord, I'm quiet. I'm silent before him. I turn down all of the, the, the other sounds in my life, which is usually like at 5.30 in the morning. Really? 5.30 in the morning? I'm listening to the Lord because there's no other distraction You want to hear God? Think about that spontaneous thought and begin to turn down the volume all the other voices in your life. The other thing is getting community. When you look at, when you look at the Apostle Paul, uh, one of the things that, that happened uh, for him, well, if you look at, just look at Acts 11. Um, there's, there's this transition happening in, in the Bible where, or when the spreading of the gospel where it's beginning to go out towards the Gentiles. And um, it says in Antioch, there were people who decided that they were gonna begin preaching the gospel to uh, the Gentiles. And so they, they, they actually formed a church. And the church in Jerusalem heard about this. And so um, it actually says they heard news of this and they sent Barnabas. Which is kind of like, well, well, they just sent Barnabas. So they heard what was happening, and then something decided, something within them said, oh, let's send Barnabas. 
up to Antioch to check this thing out. So Barnabas goes up to Antioch and he sees, this is just a summarizing of the, the narrative, he sees that it's good what's happening and that the Lord is on it. And then like in this very sort of awkward transition, Luke goes, so Barnabas goes to Tarsus looking for, for Saul or Paul. There's no reasoning why. It's just he saw what was happening and he, he probably had this thought. You know what? I heard about this guy who is the, the God's vessel to the Gentiles. I think I'm going to go find him. Maybe I'll need him. And so he goes up and he finds Paul and he brings him back to Antioch and they do ministry. And then in chapter 13, um, it says that they're all worshiping. They're all serving the Lord. And then they had this, this idea. Let's, let's become missionaries. So then the very next verse is Paul and Barnabas are being sent out as missionaries. And it says the church, they laid their hands upon them and they blessed what the God was doing within them. And then it says they sent them out. And then throughout Paul's missionary journeys, you see God leading him every step of the way. But all of that leading, get this, all of that leading, all of that, that activity of the Spirit, all of that confirmation of the Spirit, the confirmation of assignment, all of it is, is not without community. If, if you are, like, I'm serious, you're like, oh, I, gotta, I, have to, I have to figure out what God wants for, me to do with my, wants for me to do with my life, or yeah, wants to do with my life. What is the good work? And you're not within a, a, a body of people that can help discern what that is and see what God is doing within you. If there are not those people in your life, then you need those people. You have to get in community. You have to get around other more mature voices that understand and know how to hear God so that they can hear God for you. You might hear something and you might be able to say, hey guys, I heard, to, I heard that maybe the Lord wants me to do this. Do you, think that this is, do you think this is God? You need people in your life that can say no. As well as people in your life who can say, you know what, I think that's God. Let's, let's lay hands on you and bless you and send you into that. And you have to understand, it's not just, it's not just ministry. It's not just ministry. It's all things. It's kingdom stuff. Like the Bible gives us this scope of like what it is to, you know, serve the Lord in foreign nations and to travel and to preach the gospel. And that's all the book of Acts. And, but understand, like it, it wasn't sort of written in the, the modern context where we have, you know, businesses and uh, Teachers and doctors and nurses and lawyers. I would just, the, the, the Bible doesn't show us what it looks like to be kingdom people in those aspects. And that doesn't mean that God isn't saying, yeah, go to nursing school. Because he might be. The point is you, you need people in order to do the good work of the kingdom. You need the voice of God. And you need people who know the voice of God and can bless you in that. And the last thing that I have for you, and it's really good news, and you need to know this, that God is more committed to his words for you than you are to him. He is committed. And, and Ezra, after the, the proclamation is made, and, and Shesh Bazar goes, yeah, that's it. The king pulls out his accountant and says, you know, all of that stuff that we, we took from the temple, let's give it all back and more. He's committed. God is committed to you. After 400 years of captivity, uh, Israel was crying out to the Lord in Egypt and God said, you know what? I remember my covenant with Abraham. Let's do something. He's committed. The Bible, the Bible, if one thing that it teaches us is that God is fully committed to his plan and his purposes. Amen? All right, let's stand.
We thank you, Lord, for your word. Not, not just the word that comes through the Holy Spirit, but God, the, the word that we get from Scripture. We thank you, Lord, that it teaches us, that it instructs us, that it leads us in the way of righteousness. And Lord, everything that we hear from the Spirit is actually in line with what you've written in your revelation of yourself. That the two things, Lord, will never be in disagreement. They'll always be in agreement. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, God, for your commitment to us. We thank you for your commitment to a, a plan for our life, a very specific personal plan. We thank you, Lord, that you lead us and you guide us. Just like, just like you led the Apostle Paul throughout the world to spread the gospel, you, God, lead each of and every one of us throughout our lives to be kingdom people and to carry the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray for the the ones who are here, Lord, today that are, are struggling. They're, they're just, they feel lost. They feel like no sense of direction. I pray, Lord, today that through the power of the Holy Spirit and even, Lord, the power of your word, your spoken word, that you would show them the compass that they have in you. And you give them direction. And you give them guidance. And Lord, as, as you, you provided for me, not the, not the whole picture, not the beginning to the end, not even from the end to the beginning, but God, for them, you give them the first step. And for some of you, that, the first step is really just in, into a relationship with Jesus. You need to get in, in a place where you can be intimate with him. You get right with him. Just need to say, Lord, I, I, I repent. And I believe the gospel. I believe the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. If you're here today and you'd like someone just to pray with you before you leave, our ministry team will be up front. Um, otherwise, God bless you today. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. Amen.